Hello and welcome to God Day. My name is Sylvia and today I'm going to talk, be talking about being the salt of the earth, okay? And the scripture comes from Matthew 5, 13 to 16. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's saying, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. So Jesus commands us to go out and become salt and to be light. He's telling us that we are salt and we are light. And he's telling us that we should shine our lights before men so that people will see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Now, why does he talk about salt? Now, salt is a very important product. In fact, salt was used as an exchange, like money, as a currency. That is where we have um, get the word salary. And in the Eastern countries, salt was used it wasn't very pure it was mingled with vegetables or, or earthy substances so that it could lose its whole saltiness but in general salt pure salt does not lose its saltiness and so Jesus when he's speaking he likes to compare things that are around him and he uses parables so that the people can understand what he's talking about and he's saying that we shouldn't mm, mingle our salt our saltiness with impurity and we should make it stay pure now salt was also very important in in, in old days and I, I think if if you're a little bit older you will remember how salt was used to preserve meats and in, in many many years ago when there was no electricity um, salt is actually um, covered um, the, the, uh, the meat is covered with salt and it's hung out to dry and it can last for many many years just on it like months at least I know and um, it does it, it doesn't go off and so salt has a very um, important significance if a food we eat is too salty it's impossible for us to eat it and if there's not enough salt then it's tasteless but we are asked to be like the salt of the earth to bring flavor to the earth and so when I look at the scripture, I think of being a Christian who goes out to evangelize, um, being a Christian who wants everyone around me to know that there is a Christ who saves. And I know that there are a lot of Christians who go out and their sole purpose is to win souls for Christ. And, and that is why we're here. Uh, we're not here on this earth to just come, get a job, earn a salary, die and go back to heaven. No, that's not why God invested so much in our lives. He invested so much in our lives so that we can also go out and harvest souls for his kingdom. And in his kingdom, there are so many different kinds of, of Christians. There are the silent ones, you know, the ones that go to church, don't want to disturb anyone, go home, just like to you know, mind their own business, you know, in a way, and don't have much impact in other people's lives. And that's not what God calls us to be or to do. He doesn't want us to mingle our saltiness with impurities. Because if, he, if, if that happens, then, then salt can lose its flavor. He wants us to dominate where we are. 
He wants us to let people know who we are and who Christ, what Christ has done for us. And the scripture talks about the fact that people should see. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. So basically what God wants us to do is be good, be Christ-like. Be like Christ in what he did. And when we study the life of Christ, what was he about? From the young age of 12, Christ was about his father's business. Do you remember when he got lost and his mother, he got lost and it took three days for his parents to actually find him. And when they did eventually find him, they found him sitting amongst elders and, 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 and talking with them. And they went up to him and they said, did you not know that we're looking for you? And he said, I'm about my father's business. And so at such a young age, he knew exactly why he was in this earth and what he came to do. He had a mission. And that mission was to evangelize. And that mission was to win souls. That mission, mission was to bring hope to a dying world. And that is what we are called to do. And so it doesn't, it's not good to be silent. It's not good for people not to know that you are of Christ or in Christ, that Christ lives in you. Why would you? He says, you know, he says, you're the light of the world. A city is set on a hill and a city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. So you are the light of the world. In this world where there's so much suffering and so much heartache and so much pain, People are looking for answers. They're looking for answers in the wrong places. People, you know, you switch the television channels and you see um, horoscope channels. You see channels where there's mediums sitting there using tarot cards to, to predict people's futures. You know, the newspapers, uh, adverts are full of, of adverts where, you know, you can call up numbers to, to have your fortune told. People are looking for answers. Because life is so unpredictable and so much is going on, they're looking for solutions to problems. And they're turning everywhere because they can't, that we, are, we are the light, so they should turn to us. But we should also be in the forefront of things. We should be portraying Christ. He says, let your good deeds go before you. So if you, if you know someone who's looking for a solution and that person also knows you and they, they can see that this person is really Christ-like. I think she can help me with my problems. They will come to you. But if they don't see the workings of Christ in your life or in my life, why will they come to us? You know, why would, when we, we're just like them in, in every way or sense, mixing with them, becoming impure, doing what they do, drinking with them, smoking with them, swearing with them, committing adultery with them we're doing all sorts of things that they are doing why will they look to us as a solution to their problem god says that we should be good we should stand out from the crowd we should be different we should be christ-like imagine the life of jesus imagine being around him in those days he wasn't he wasn't a boring person he seemed like when you read the scriptures he was he was he was he was everywhere mixing with all different kinds of people and people who whose lives needed transformation were attracted to him because he had that charisma about him he didn't stare stand the far off he wasn't holier than thou he was a friend he was he was fun you know it's funny because when i look at pictures of christ and you know i'm always thinking there's no picture where christ is actually smiling and and maybe his head back and he's laughing with his disciples because I think that's the kind of person he was. We sometimes take him too serious. He was a good friend and a good person to be at your party, but he wasn't, he wasn't doing those things that the people were doing. He was a light in that darkness and a light that people were attracted to so much so that Zacchaeus noticed that light. He noticed that light and he... He was a tax collector, despised by everyone. Everybody, even now, people still don't like tax collectors. You know, there are certain jobs when you have them, 
people don't like you very much, like traffic wardens and tax collectors. But this guy was a tax collector. Nobody, people hated him. And, and, and yet, um, as, uh, he saw, Zacchaeus saw that light in Christ. And he came down from the tree, was high up in the tree, and Jesus saw him. And with a word of knowledge, called him by name, and he came down. And he says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house tonight. Imagine, somebody that everybody despises. Jesus went to his house, was entertained by Zacchaeus. And the light in Jesus' life shone through so much that Zacchaeus, we don't know what was said. We don't even know whether Jesus said anything. Because sometimes you don't have to say anything. You can be a Christian, you're not, you haven't even said anything, but there's something in you that is attractive to, and, 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 and brings a sinner to repentance. Zacchaeus just came and he says, you know what? From this day, I'm a changed man. I'm going to give, I, in fact, I'm going to give back half of, of everything that I've taken from people, you know, and meeting Jesus made, transformed his life so much. And, and that is what it, it means to be the light of the world. It means that wherever we go, we shine. And sometimes you will bear witness with me when you meet a Christian, you both of you haven't spoken and then suddenly you just feel, are you a Christian? Yes, I knew it. There's something about you. There's just something. I just felt that, you know, that the spirit of God is one between you and me. And, you know, you know, there's that light that shines out. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants our light to shine brightly. And he wants our light. And he wants us to be good. He doesn't want us to be one of the sinners. He doesn't say we shouldn't mix with them because we need to mingle with them so that they can know him. Because we can't be afar off and them be afar off. He needs us to, to be friends with with all kinds of people, but he doesn't want us to live their lifestyle. He wants us to be a light amongst them. I, it's so interesting. I remember there was a time when um, I was in a work situation. I was working for someone and I wasn't the boss. They were, and they wanted to have a party. And they had this party and they invited me. And it's so interesting. Um, they wanted to, they, 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 you know, when I was there, everybody was, at their best behavior, I don't know why, I was, just, I was just a normal staff member. I wasn't even management or anything. And everybody was just, you know, happy and doing stuff, you know, you know, enjoying the party. And as soon as I left, they said, it's like somebody said, um, when you were around, they, 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 they recognized Christ in you and they respected the Christ in you. And so if people wanted to maybe smoke or have an extra drink, they didn't do that because you were there. And, I, and when you left, that's when they did. And I was so, I was like, but why? I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't management or anything. They could have just carried on as normal. But they said they just respected the Christ that was in me. And they just refrained from doing certain things when I was there. And I think, wow, you know, it's good to have Christ with you. I, I met another colleague in another workplace and He'd been, he, he, you know, I, as soon as I entered, everybody knew I was a Christian because from conversation, people say, what do you do? And you end up telling them what you do. And I am you know, being part of even Revelation TV, I said, oh, and I, and I'm, I'm, I volunteer with a Christian television station and all that sort of thing. So, um, you know, they know that you're a Christian. And I was there for a few weeks. I didn't stay that long. And um, there was this gentleman, he called me quietly and he said, Christian too, but they don't know. And I'm like, why? They should know. You shouldn't pretend to be like them. They should know that you are a Christian. God says we should be light. And it's funny because when I was um, studying on um, salt and light, I, I remember the story of Lot. And if you remember the story of Lot, it was an interesting one. Lot was uh, a nephew to Abraham, and he moved from uh, he moved out with Abraham. One and Abraham was seeking and you know going was going to find the promised land. Lot went along with him, but Lot had a different character from Abraham. Lot's eyes were too well, very worldly, you know, and there was a, there was one point where Lot's men they all prospered. 
And Lot's men were fighting with Abraham's men, and so they had to part. And Abraham says to Lot, "Look to the look anywhere you want. You can if I if you want to go left, I'll go right, and if you want to go right, I'll go left." And the Bible says that Lot looked and he saw, and his eyes, you know, saw all the wonders of of of, of a city or a town that wasn't godly, but looked like it would make him have a good lifestyle, basically. And so he chose that and. So he went to live in Sodom and Gomorrah, near Sodom and Gomorrah, and we know what happened after that. Now, the interesting thing about Lot is um, when some angels came to visit Abraham, do you remember there were three, three men that came and Abraham entertained them? And when they were leaving, they looked over to where um, Lot was living and they said, I'll read it here, it says, um, they look towards them, and this is um, uh, Genesis chapter 18, verse 16. It says, Then the men rose from where, from there, and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, um, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And so they went on to talk about the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah being great. And the angel said they were going to go down and have a look basically at what was going on, because this outcry had come to the ears of God. And Abraham... Um, here's what's going on and he's pleading on behalf of this um, of this town and he's begging the angels and he's saying please don't destroy them and the angel said okay this is God actually speaking like through this these men and he says okay I won't destroy them if and I'm going on to uh, verse 27 no verse 26 he says so the Lord says if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare the whole place for their sakes. So then Abraham answered and said, hmm, indeed now, I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than the 50 righteous. Would you destroy all of the city for the lack of five? So he's talking about 45. Now, Abraham is negotiating with God because Abraham knows Lot. Abraham, Lot is a light. Lot has, has God in him. But Lot has kept that light to himself. He's hiding it under a bushel. He's not shared or spread this light that is within him. And Abraham knows that. Abraham's thinking... <laughs> I don't think my nephew is going to is is going to share or he's going to be um God's God fearing as I I know I he should be. Because if you listen to what God says about Abraham, Abraham God is so confident in Abraham. God says, For I have I'll go back again to this verse. It says in verse eighteen, he says, um or nineteen, he says, I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. God had confidence in Abraham. He knew that he would share his knowledge of God to his children, to his whole household, and to even strangers. But Lot wasn't like that. And so Abraham knew that and he was pleading on behalf. So he starts to negotiate with God and he starts, he's from 50 and he's going down to 45. And then he goes to 40. And then he pleads again and then he spoke to him again and said, suppose there should be 40 there. And then he says, God says, okay, if there's 40, I, I will not destroy. Imagine the power of the light of God. God will spare a nation if there are righteous people in that land. Imagine, God says that he would spare Sodom and Gomorrah if there were even 
40 people. Now, I, didn't, I don't know the exact number of people in Sodom and Gomorrah, and I'm sure if you research it, you'll probably be astounded as to the amount of people that were there. There were probably quite a lot of people, and yet God was prepared to spare the land for 40. But Abraham didn't have much confidence in Lot because Lot was not shining that light out like he should. So Abraham continued to negotiate. And he says, okay, um, so he says, I will do it for the sake of 40. And then he says, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak, suppose 30 should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, indeed now, I've taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20, 20 should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Then he said, not, let not the Lord be angry. And I'll speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. Imagine. God would not have destroyed Sodom if Lot's light had shined brightly into that place. And have even five people extra because imagine like lot had a family okay so we're talking lot his wife his two daughters so that's four so if they'd even saved six god would not have destroyed sodom and gomorrah but lot's light did not shine like it was supposed to i don't know what he was doing in sodom and gomorrah because it did say at the beginning when the angels went to the city he was sitting in the gate with them, with the, with the people. So he was mingling with the people and the gate of a city is where all business takes place, where the judgments of the different things, happenings takes place. So he was in the center of things. Lot was in the center of things in Sodom and Gomorrah and yet his light did not shine out. People did not come to know God. So I don't know why Lot did not shine his light. But this is an example that if your light can shine out forth and bring souls to Christ, nations can be saved because of the evangelism. And so, as it happens, out of Lot's family, we, we, we read uh, that Lot's daughters were engaged to be married, so they had um, in-laws. And yet, when Lot was talking to them about what was happening, or when the angels came to the city, they were, the, 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 the sons-in-laws were, they thought he was joking because I think they considered Lot a joker. They didn't take him serious. And so even when they were saying, we let's leave the city, let's flee, the son-in-law says, oh, this man is joking. And they stayed and they were destroyed. So I gave this example of Lot as an example of a light that did not shine out to save a nation. And his light could have saved that town, but it didn't. So Jesus says to us, let our light shine. And you know, as Christians, we read of evangelists. We read of, the, we read of those wonderful people, those men and women of God, even from the United Kingdom that went into Africa. They went into different parts of the world, into harsh terrain, harsh territory to evangelize the gospel. There were stories of people dying of malaria and them calling, you know, speaking, sending messages to the United Kingdom and saying, you know, the people we've sent, you've sent over half of them have died, send some more. You know, people were ready to die for this gospel. And God, you know, isn't it interesting that those, the lives of those saints, they didn't die in vain. Our countries and our nations will be saved because of these people, because of the light that shone out of them that spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, there's nothing we do for Christ that goes um, without reward. Not that we deserve reward, but yet God's grace, he's so gracious to us, he can see the work we do for him. And he, he rewards, the Bible says he rewards those who diligently seek him. And so this is an example. Don't be like a lot that hides his light under the bushel. And you can see, um, he was considered a righteous man um, in, the, in, in, in the New Testament, Lot was referred to. So yes, he was a righteous man in his heart, but he didn't evangelize. He didn't take that light out and change lives as a result of it. 
and as a result, he lost his inheritance. He lost his inheritance. He didn't lose his salvation, but he lost his inheritance. And there's a lot of inheritance waiting for us. There's crowns to be placed on our heads as we walk into, through the gates of heaven. And wouldn't it be wonderful to have a good, a, one great crown placed on your head as a result of, 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 of bringing souls to Christ? Because they say it's a wise man that brings souls to Christ. So our duty on earth is not just to wake up in the morning, go to work, look at our bills, pay our bills, come home, get up and go back. Our duty is to win souls. That is why we are on earth. That is the main reason. When Jesus was given the Great Commission, what did he say? He says he, he told us to go out into all the nations and to preach. He says we should lay hands on the sick. We should deliver people that need deliverance. He says we should set the captive free. That is our duty, not just the day-to-day -day livings of work, home, work, home, or being a quiet and Christian like Lot, just you and your family. And Lot couldn't even affect his wife. You know, he couldn't even affect his wife. She was the one that still had something in her heart that was drawn to Sodom. And she turned around and she became a pillow of salt. So my word for you today is let's not be like Lot and keep our, our light hidden under a bushel. Let's be like Jesus. Let's be like the saints. Let's be like those evangelists that go out into nations and preach. Wherever you are, be the light of the earth. Be the salt of the earth. Bring salvation to mankind. That is why we are here. God bless you and have a good day. Amen.